Ok. I think we're gonna wait uh, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, two, three minutes more to see that if uh, more people are joining, we have currently 14 people. Okay, <clears throat> let's start. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining uh, this uh, ING uh, Scala meetup. Um, the people um, presenting today, we have two awesome guests, awesome speakers are Mark and Yerud. Mark is a computer scientist. Uh, he worked as a, as a consultant and uh, loves building products, uh, tech products, of course, and he's very passionate about uh, technology, uh, craftsmanship, craftsmanship, and building uh, teams. Uh, Jeroen is uh, an Amsterdam-based uh, primary software engineer and consultants focus on uh, building resilient software. He works at Cibia. He's actually the founder of the Amsterdam Scala user group, so what an honor. And um, when not coding, he says he likes to train, um, writing, uh, and uh, he also likes uh, uh, to play a lot uh, with his uh, with his kids. And actually, that's a good excuse uh, uh, to play again with Lego. So um, I'm gonna cut it short. We have an awesome topic today, which is about uh, Scala like Band Cloud Flow, building uh, stream processing uh, pipeline at scale which is uh, quite an important topic for uh, these days, uh, real world uh, problems. So I'm going to uh, cut it short and give the um, the, the voice to uh, Jeroen and Mark, which will be our uh, speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Salvatore. Thank you. So, hi, guys. Uh, hi. We're live now. Very cool. Very happy, um, very happy to uh, yeah to be invited to uh, to this uh, Scala meetup and uh, perform our talk. Um, yeah, very excited uh, that this is actually even in uh, COVID times we have a live stream. Um, everything is set up and we can still uh, share this content uh, with you all. So um, very much welcome. Thanks all for joining. Um, we do have actually quite a lot of content. We have also code sound slides we have some uh, some demos so I won't uh, waste time and uh, quickly want to get started um, I want to ask you if you have any questions uh, please leave them in the comments we will try to keep an eye on this uh, during the talk and also try to find some moments during the talk uh, to to answer some intermediate questions so you don't have to wait uh, until the very end uh, so we will try to uh, to fit it in um, yeah well so Salvatore already uh, made a made a great introduction, so I will keep this short. Yeah, I'm Jeroen. Um, uh, use my details if you want to reach out later. Um, I'm here with Mark Roden. Um, yeah, we, we did a project together uh, at at ING uh, when I uh, was uh, um, basically uh, I, I'm I'm consultant for CB, so we did a project together at uh, at ING. That's how we met, and uh, that's when we started investigating this topic and uh, and building this talk together. So um, very cool. So Mark basically, introduced me. Basically yeah, go for it. Building something that uh, that we were building uh, using a completely different technology. So. Uh, Mapping yeah. that uh, that product to uh, to see how we could apply Cloudflow, basically. 
Yeah, exactly. So it's an actual use case. It's an actual use case. So um, yeah, Mark introduced me to to bond trading, to the bond trading world. I mean, I've seen this movie, the the Boiler Room. I'm not sure if you guys did, but uh, I think it's uh, it's a great movie. Um, yeah, and I was also new to to the bond trading world. Uh, so I also uh, won't ask you for your bankers. So if you don't need to be a domain expert in this, I'll try to to keep this talk uh, simple. Um, but it is important to at least know a few terms. Um, so I, we made a little glossary here um, about the bond trading domain. So so what is what is bond? A bond is basically a loan. Mark, please correct me if I say if I explain it wrong. But basically, a loan taken out by a company, and um, a company um, can get money from investors who buy this bond. Um, and a bond uh, is. Uh, identified by an uh, uh, in identification number, an international securities identification number. Um, uh, in short, that's ISIN. Um, and um, a financial institutes like banks, but also like insurance companies, they can um, basically uh, request uh, for a quote on a bond. Uh, if they want to buy a bond, basically they can make a request um, uh, for, for an offer on uh, on a bond, um, and then um, there's two other important terms: that's the bid price and the ask price. This is at any given point in time. Um, the bid price is the best potential price a buyer wants to transact at, and the ask price is the potential price a seller of a bond wants to transact at. And yeah, you can guess it. If they meet, then a trade might happen. So yes, this is. Typically- Typically, RFQs, they, uh, so a request for a quote goes, goes from one party to a select group of other parties. I uh, think about five or six different parties that you would want to interact with, um, either for selling something you, that you own or for, uh, for buying something that, uh, that you're interested in owning. And then it's up to those parties to, uh, to reply to the RFQ with uh, um, their price, basically. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so actually, this, this is all you need to know. So we will use the term rfq and isin uh, during the examples but um yeah now i hope you have an idea of what that means and if not uh, if you want some extra explanation please drop a comment uh, for now i will continue uh, because we're here uh, not to talk about bond trading only but we're actually we want to build an app um, and we want to pro- uh, provide some insights into the bond trading world um, uh, with our with our app um, so let's the def- base features um, first of all, we want to show the recent RFQs that come in, uh, and we want to enrich that with like relevant metadata of the bond. Um, yeah, so it would be cool if we have like a web page where we can have like live RFQs uh, that are happening. Um, yeah, with with uh, with the metadata attached to it in a, in a, in a view. Um, second of all, we will want to show a predicted price for a bond so um, as I ex- tried to explain before uh, we have we have the ask prices and the bid prices so it's kind of like a game of um, what would be um, uh, the, what will the price be where it, uh, when a trade will be made right? so uh, we want to try to predict this so uh, to also give the opportunity to make better bids right to to, uh, to get a trade at a sharper price um so that's the second thing and, and the third thing is um that we want to store the raw raw rfq data in uh, let's say google bigquery for further analysis so yeah we have a bunch of data scientists um that are ready to uh, to crunch this data so we want to make it available to them but we just want to export it in, a, in the raw format uh in the rawest format possible so they can go wild with it so what we're looking for is kind of like a Lambda architecture in which we combine streaming data flows and batch processes. Um, so the, the RFQs are live, so that's the, that's the streaming part. It's very important that we get them on the screen as fast as possible. But for the RFQ data that, um, that uh, needs to be available for analysis, it's less important um, that, it's like, that it's live. It's just, it has to, it has to be there. Um, so that could be done in in uh, that could be perfectly done in batch process. So um, we are looking for um, for a combination of both. 
so how how would that look like in a diagram? So we have basically two layers in our application. We have the streaming layer that uh, always computes a real-time view as the data comes in. So the RFQs come in, um, the, the metadata comes in, and we have a streaming layer crunching um, and uh, always computing this real-time view, which will feed to, uh, to our user interface. Um, then also we have a batch layer where we have our data scientists, they are crunching the numbers. Um, and at some point, we're getting an updated batch view from them. So they their work, have uh, machine learning algorithms, um, a model comes out, uh, then a prediction comes out. They all serve it in a batch view, and, and that view we will present to our user interface. It's a combination of batch and streaming. What, what may be interesting to add is that if, you, if a party sends out an RFQ, there's typically a time frame of about maximum 30 seconds um, for a party to respond to. Um, so one of the prerequisites that we had in, in, in this was that we want to get the RFQ, the raw data, without any prediction of what we think that we should buy or sell for to the end user as soon as possible. And the end user obviously is a trader um, who then has the maximum amount of time to also use his knowledge, of course, to uh, start thinking about what a good price would be. Um, and in the meantime, we would be able to enrich uh, the user interface with our predicted, uh, predicted price. Yeah, thank you for that. So let's talk about the data sources. I already mentioned uh, a stream of RFQs. Uh, for this use case, we imagine they, they come in over HTTP. Um, then we also have the bid ask prices that we will need for our prediction. Uh, let's say they all come in over uh, HTTP. And then um, the, the third data source would be uh, the ISIN data. So that is the, uh, the meta, metadata for, uh, for an RFQ defined by the, by the ISIN identification number, sorry, uh, the ISIN. And of course, since this, this is like an enterprise product right there, there's an FTP server somewhere. So let's imagine that this comes in uh, through uh, regular updates on an FTP server that we will have to pull it off from. Um, so this is, these are the data sources that we, uh, that we imagine for this, uh, this app. Um, and then how would, how would our application uh, look like if we would draw it in a, out in a component diagram? It would probably look uh, something like this. Uh, so we have on the left-hand side, we have the data sources. So we have the RFQs, the bid ask prices, and the metadata. And then there will be like a processing block in the middle. And uh, I already uh, mentioned that we want to export to BigQuery. So there's an outgoing flow uh, of data to BigQuery. Um, where uh, basically our, our data scientists are using like any, uh, any tools like Jupyter or Spark to further process it. Um, and of course, there's a database uh, that uh, yeah, needs to, to collect the current, uh, the current state of our application uh, uh, that will be consumed by, by the UI, basically, our, our application itself. Um, yeah, that's 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 the basic overview. So this stream processor block that's here right in the middle, what does it what does it have to do? Um, it has to uh, ingest data from several sources. So we have different protocols. We have HTTP. We also have FTP. Um, it needs to combine those those data streams. Uh, it needs to enrich our RFQ model um, with the metadata, for instance. Uh, we need to do uh, calculation of the predictions on the RFQ stream. We need to stream the enriched RFQs to Firestore. We need to stream the predictions to Firestore. And we need to stream the raw RFQ data to BigQuery. It's, it's actually quite a lot of different tasks that we have to perform. So we are dealing with different data streams that may or may not be interconnected. And when designing your application, you would probably handle those different streams in different stream uh, processing components. And those components, they have different characteristics and different needs. Um, for instance, when it comes to scaling, uh, so you would ideally want those components to be able to scale independently. Um, 
Some need more uh, more resources in terms of uh, memory. Some can be horizontally scalable over multiple instances. Um, also, you need a different framework like uh, that that does the job. So uh, you can think of Akka streams or Flink or Kafka. Um, if you have uh, stateful processes, um, which we'll uh, explain later, uh, stateful stream processing, then you you rather look into something like Flink. But if you have like stateless, uh, just stateless streams where you have to apply some transformations on, maybe Akka streams will be will be a better fit. Um, for the data science part, uh, you might want to look into Spark. Uh, also, those components might have different SLAs. So some components are really on the critical path um, of, uh, of our application. I mean, if the RFQs are not streamed to our, our live view, uh, we're basically done. The application is pretty useless. But if we miss out on a few uh, raw RFQs for analysis, um, it, it's still pretty accurate, probably. So it, it's not the end of the world. So there's, there's different uh, SLAs in place, um, different requirements when it comes to downtime for, for those uh, components. Also, the release frequency might be different. Um, it depends on, on uh, some, some of the stream components have a quite frequently changing roadmap. So new features might be rolled out. Uh, many rolling updates might be needed, uh, but some might be uh, might be quite stable, right? If you if you know how to uh, how to pull uh, an ice metadata uh, uh, from uh, from the FTP, and the metadata format itself doesn't change often, that that's probably a pretty stable component. You won't have to touch uh, for a long time. But uh, the machine learning algorithm might be bound to change uh, very frequently, so uh, you might want to take that into account. So wouldn't it be great to have those uh, stream processing components completely independent so that we can like fully tune them to our needs, uh, considering all those different uh, different needs that we just discussed. Um, in, the, in the next uh, slides, Mark is gonna, gonna introduce you to the, to the Cloudflow a platform that we think provides a solution to this. So I'm gonna switch uh, my screen now to, and, uh, yeah, give, give him the mic, basically. Thank you. All right. So um, obviously, with all the requirements that we have, um, one option is to just build a microservice landscape, have all these different services interact um, with the ecosystems that they need to use with any potential external APIs. Um, but this obviously leads to a lot of operational overhead. And that's also what, uh, what some people uh, um, thought at, uh, at Lightband. So Cloudflow is basically a toolkit that they built to address all these different needs. Um, it, it helps make sure that we tick all the boxes, um, but without having to worry much about all the added complexity that uh, maintaining microservice landscapes brings with it in terms of operationability, maintainability, and what's forth. So um, it's a new toolkit from Lightband to basically build distributed streaming applications. And it allows you to split up your application in independent stream processing components, um, which they call streamlets. So uh, if you think about the image that we showed, um, each box, um, for, so for example, an ingestion part for RFQs would be a streamlet. A um, enrichment um, in Flink would be a streamlet. Um, so think about these, these functional concepts as, as the, the building blocks of your, uh, your streaming application. Um, they can be connected to each other um, through a concept which is called inlets and outlets. And these inlets and outlets are defined in a definition that um, they call a blueprint. And we'll show, uh, we'll show that later. And it also, um, especially to, to alleviate you uh, from the operational burden, it automatically deploys your streamers individually um, as Kubernetes pods and ensures that any data between your streamers is um, flowing uh, through an event bus. Um, in this case, it's uh, it's Kafka. So um, they are the core building blocks, the streamlets, and they represent our stream processing co uh, components, um, and they're connected uh, using inlets and outlets. And the way that the connect that they connect, so that the, the, the basically, if you think about the different inlets and, and outlets, they call that a shape. So a shape. Um, is, is how 
a stream that is defined. So it can have multiple or zero or more inlets. Um, so it can read zero or more um, different data points or data sources, basically. Um, and it can also output zero to more outlets or data sources. And that's the way that you can basically hook them up together and, and basically create your streaming application. Um, the logic you as, that you as a developer have to implement is only the actual core logic. So the stream, the, the processing graph basically of whatever your streamlet in this case is doing. Um, so data flows in through one or more inlets. Some processing that you define is happening, which is the, the business logic and data flows out through one or more or zero or more outlets. Um, the way that they, they run this is by leveraging Kubernetes and basically every streamlet is an independent entity and gets deployed as a replica set onto Kubernetes, um, which means that it gives you the option to scale them individually. Um, so if there is a, a need to scale, um, for example, when I said that we want to get the RFQ data as soon as possible to the, the front end, um, that's something we would typically be scaling out more to have more resilience and uh, fill over. Um, then maybe the, the component or the streamlet that takes care of um, the predictions, for example. So streamlets, they are connected, as I mentioned, through Kafka. Um, so they send and receive data to each other from, uh, from Kafka. And if you've never heard of Kafka, think about it as a persistent message bus. Um, a streamlet that is listening to, to data, so basically that, that is using an, an inlet, um, it obviously needs to read the data from Kafka and the, to determine where um, or, or what data it already has processed and what data it should still process when it starts up, so when it connects to Kafka. That's a concept that they use that they call um, or that they work with consumer offsets. So the streamlet as a consumer to a specific topic, as it's referred to in Kafka, um, maintains an offset of which messages you basically process already. And um, the streamlet will ensure for you that the co consumer offset committing, which is basically telling Kafka, hey, this message was processed successfully, that is taken care of for you as soon as your business logic in that, in that streamlet uh, ran successfully. And so that's one of the concepts that you don't need to worry about when using this. So you can imagine that if one of those streamlets would, uh, would crash, um, let's say that there's a network outage or one of your nodes goes down, uh, the pods will, uh, will restart and it will simply um, restart, reconnect to, uh, to Kafka. It will read the consumer offsets that Kafka has uh, associated to your, uh, your consumer group and it will start off where it's left off uh, its work. So if we go back to the requirements, um, we can basically handle all of these requirements um, using a, a separate streamlet. Um, so each of these bullet points um, could end up being a separate streamlet. And if you would map that onto a, uh, an architecture diagram that could look like something like this. So on one end, we have two external data sources, as, uh, as Jeroen showed. We have some, some ISIN data um, coming in, and we have RFQs coming in. So there are two ingress, um, ingress components. And in between those, uh, the, the basically our or data stores on the right side, so Firestore and BigQuery, we use specific streamlets to either enrich data, run some business logic um, to predict um, the, the best bid or ask price to, uh, to buy or sell for. And we also have exporters, which, uh, which put the data into a external uh, data store. So this all looks nice, uh, but you need to, we, well, we somehow need to tell Cloudflow what this, uh, what all these connections look like. This, each of these arrows is basically defining an, an inlet or an outlet in that sense. And somehow um, with Cloudflow managing all that, that infrastructure for you in the communication with Kafka and so forth, well, it somehow needs to know what kind of data you're, pro you're sending uh, and then processing basically. So, um, there is some transformations happening between when a streamlet reads data from Kafka um, and converts it into the local data structure that you will work with. So if you reason about a little piece of code, um, it, it's, it's, as we're working with Scala, it's typed. So you would probably have some sort of type definition, a case class or what, whatnot, to define your RFQ or to define your ISIN. Um, and that object obviously needs to be able to be constructed from the data which is uh, written by a different streamlet onto a Kafka topic. 
Um, so if you think about the, our first stream, is you could say that we define a, a record which is called, uh, called foo, and we will do this by using a codec that I'll, I'll show you a bit later on. Um, this streamlet, as an inlet, um, reads foo, and it will transform foo into some bar, and it will again, uh, well, Cloudflow for you will transform that into a record which gets serialized to, uh, to a message on Kafka. Um, some other streamlet would then be able to read uh, read that record, convert it back to a bar, uh, because obviously the outlet and the inlet need to match in schema, because otherwise there's no uh, no way to uh, to read the data properly. And it could determine that it would want to convert that to something completely different again and output a, a bash, um, which will get serialized again. So what Cloudflow now uses is Avro, and Avro is basically a schema evolution um, codec. So it's a, it's a definition in which you define um, your schema. So which properties do you have, um, and uh, what kind of what kind of types are they? And the good thing about Avro is um, that it supports schema evolution. Um, so you will be able to evolve your schema uh, without breaking um, upstream consumers if you adhere to specific uh, specific rules. So the, what, what Cloudflow does is it uses a plugin, an Afro plugin, which basically generates the case classes that you can use within your streamlets based on the Afro schema that you define. So from a developer perspective, the only thing you need to do is you define your Afro schemas, um, which I'll show in a, in a, in a minute, and um, SPT with Cloudflow will take care of converting that to actual case classes that you can use within your code. So if you look at, at the simple uh, Afro schema for the RFQ, um, the general things that, that an Afro schema defines is a namespace. This is basically the package that's uh, in, in, in Java that will get generated for you. Um, there is a type, won't, won't get into that now. Um, obviously, a name, this will result in the name of your object, and it has a field definition. So basically, what are what are all the properties or fields that this um, no, that this case class will, uh, will, look, uh, will have? Um, so the name and the need to fields. So a field, if you look at it, it, it defines a name. Uh, and it obviously defines the type. Um, you can even go further and say there are some logical types for complex type mapping. So you can have a timestamp um, uh, that you can convert between a melee since epoch timestamp uh, into a Java instance. And this is the way that you would, uh, would do so. Or you could say, I want to have some big decimal, um, but um, in Afro, it will be a, a decimal with a specific position and scale, uh, which maps to a, a big decimal in uh, in Java or, uh, or Scala, in this case. Um, and since we're working with financial data, you definitely want to use big decimal uh, instead of doubles or floats. So what you can also do if you want to take it a, a step further is you can um, have relationships, because what, what is a model without having um, relationships with other models? Um, so what you can do is you can define an external model, basically embedding re other records into this one. Um, and in this case, we're embedding the bid ask price model into our RFQ. So the RFQ object will have a bid ask price um, uh, property, which is an instance of the bid ask prices, basically. So here, um, it allows you to prevent duplication by having to copy the entire bid ask prices um, object into or Afro definition into this file. You can simply refer to it, and um, it will be taken care of for you. So now that we have our data model defined, we can basically start building streamlets. Uh, we know what we want to send out uh, and what the data looks like, so it's, uh, it's time to do some, uh, some of the fun work. Um, let's start with the one, one of the simpler ones. Let's start with RFQ ingress. Um, we said that the RFQs, they came over HTTP. So um, we are going to start working with a ACA servlet streamlet. Um, so I said that a streamlet has a shape. And this shape, you can see that it's defined here. The shape defines the number of, of in, inlets and outlets, as I mentioned before. Um, for the ingress streamlet, there is no inlet, because an inlet is only useful if you're actually reading data from a different streamlet. But since we're connecting to an external HTTP API, that's not the case. Um, so that's why our shape does not define any inlets. It simply defines one outlet. Um, and the outlet is basically of type RFQ. Um, so for the HTTP ingress, uh, there, are, um, well, there, there are several different streamlet types that you can use. Uh, we'll get to a Flink, Flink one and an Akka one later on. But for this one, we're using Akka server streamlet. And what this streamlet for you does is in the background, it will spin up an Akka HTTP server for you 
it will expose expose an HTTP endpoint um, that you can simply call um, to to perform whatever action that you're going to define in the shape later. So here you can already see that there's a lot of work that, that um, Cloudflow does for you. Um, thinking about if you were to build this yourself, you would have to configure the server, you would have to map it to ports, you would have to create an API, you would have to test that API endpoint, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. Um, on this line, you can see that we're actually defining the outlet. So as you can see here, it's a, an outlet of the type RFQ. And we specify a name and a key. And especially the key is, is super important. Um, for those that are a bit familiar with Kafka, Kafka has a concept called partitions. And ba basically partitions based on a key that you assign it to. And this is a way that you can ensure that data related to the same key always goes to the same partition of Kafka. A consumer typically um, consumes from one or more um, partitions from a, from a topic. And by doing so, you ensure that all data related to a specific key is always read in the same uh, same sequence, which is pretty nice uh, as a guarantee to have. And by the same consumer, yeah. Yeah, by the same consumer, yeah. that's a valid point, yeah. So think about the consumer group, um, that's uh, that's basically what defines the uh, sequence. Um, so now that we have an RFQ ingress, uh, it couldn't be simpler than this. If you think about it, this, there, there's nothing here to expose an endpoint. I'm sorry if I disappoint you, but this is it. Um, we're going to look at the export because that's the next thing we want to do. Any raw data that we get in, we just want to export to BigQuery as soon as possible. We don't know what, what data scientists want to do with it or what we as engineers may want to do with it later, uh, but we're just storing it for long-term purposes. So what this, or what this export or stream is going to do for us is we are going to read in RFQs and we're going to convert that to a format that um, BigQuery will, uh, will understand. Um, so here you can see that we are using a simple ACA streamlet. So the difference is in the previous version, I was using ACA servlet streamlet, uh, server streamlet, and this one is an ACA streamlet. The difference is that um, this one does not boot up a HTTP server for you, um, but you do still get access to all the nice things that the ACA ecosystem has to offer you in terms of uh, actors and um, ACA streams, basically. So you can also see that immediately there is this create logic function that we need to implement. And that's basically the core of, of this streamlet. That's where you as a developer will be defining the logic of this, uh, this single streamlet. Um, here we have one input, which is um, again, an RFQ. And um, so we define the shape to have an input. And since we're talking to BigQuery, which is an external system to Cloudflow, we don't have any outlets here. So again, this is a pretty simple shape, one input, zero outputs. Um, if you look at the logic, there's there's a little bit of, of logic related to uh, the BigQuery SDK, obviously. But um, what is important to note is that we are creating a source with a commit committable context. And that is basically a feature that Cloudflow gives you to read data for a specific inlet. Uh, so we pass in the inlet to that function. And that will create a Kafka consumer. That will make sure that the offset gets, uh, gets mapped at the end, um, as you can see in the map context. So what we do is you can do any kind of um, any kind of um, yeah, business logic or any kind of, of <laughs> mutations that you want to do on these objects. And at the end, all you do is you get the offset out of the stream that we built here, and we commit it to a, a sync, which will ensure that it writes the, uh, the commits to, uh, to Kafka. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, there is this concept called a blueprint. And the blueprint is basically the definition of what your Cloudflow application looks like. So if you think about the, the architecture diagram that we showed, it's basically that representation in code. So here you can see that it's a, a definition of two streamlets, the two we built so far. Um, and there's also a topic definition um, which defines which producers and which consumers there are to, uh, to that topic. And also you can see that we do hook in the inlets and the outlets here. Um, so in, in this case, the RFQ ingress is a producer for the raw RFQ data topic on Kafka. And the consumer for that will be the BigQuery exporter inlet. So this is how you see the, 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 the link between um, the name that I gave here as in. Um, that's basically the same definition that you see here coming back in the, uh, in the blueprint. So that's a, that's a valid Cloudflow application, which, uh, which you can just run. Uh, you can deploy this to Kubernetes with a, a few simple commands. 
Um, but before you are going to do that, well, it may make sense to verify whether it actually works locally in the sandbox. Uh, and Cloudflow has an option for that. So let me show you a few uh, simple things. So the blueprint is something, because this is all typed, and because uh, uh, Cloudflow knows about all the, the inputs and outputs that you have and the connections that you basically create, there's a, a neat little trick where you can say that you want to define or verify that the blueprints that you created. Um, so you can simply run a verify blueprint command. And let's hope that my laptop wants to work with me now. Um, which will validate whatever you have defined into, uh, into the blueprint. Yeah, and it will, for instance, check that um, um, basically your inlets and outlets that are connected to each other are compatible with each other so that you don't have the risk of like um, parsing data types that you don't support yep. uh, in your streamlets. So that's that's a pretty cool um, cool feature. Yeah, so the same as, as this, if I were to, to mess up something, I made a mistake, if I were to rerun this, it would know that there is no inlet defined, which is called in one. Um, so there's quite a lot of guarantees that you get out of the box by uh, by using this. If, if this was um, a non-Cloudflow uh, application, th this would be harder to test. You would probably only discover this as soon as you try to run this, uh, because you have basically separate components, separate microservices that you're going to deploy um, that don't really know about the connection between each other. Uh, it's only when you try to consume from a Kafka topic, for example, that doesn't exist yet because someone forgot to deploy it or um, those type of, of, of situations you may run into. Um, the second one that I wanted to show was the run local. And run local will um, obviously build it. It will verify the blueprint. Oh, one second, I need to fix the blueprint then. Let's see if it wants to stop now. What do you think on time? Want to see where? Yeah, we can. Uh, I think this is actually an interesting part. So maybe you can show this and um, give it five more, uh, five more seconds. Yeah. To I, I'm, I'm. Meanwhile, I'm looking at if there are some questions coming in. Um, oh, I yeah. don't see any yeah. yet. All right, so this is uh, this is it. So um, it's as I did with the first command, it will verify your blueprint, but uh, not only that, it will also outline all the connections that you have in a little uh, little graph. Um, and you can see that it actually created all your streamlets. It's running a Kafka cluster in the background with everything that you need to basically run this entire application locally. Um, so if we had more time, we would now be able to call the API endpoint, push data through it. Um, obviously, it, we would need to connect it to a real BigQuery instance, um, but you get the drift, you get the gist of this. Um, it does make local development uh, or verification a lot, uh, lot simpler. I will show that in the end of the talk uh, yeah. to with do it in the I real would, uh, instance. Yeah. yeah, with that, I would like to uh, hand it back to, uh, to Jeroen, actually. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just looking. Uh, if, um, if there are any questions about these parts so far, Please let us know in the comments. Otherwise, I can continue. If yeah, self talk would switch you. Yes, thank you. Nice. Thank you. One more time. Yes, I'm back. Cool. OK, um, yeah, so basically Mark explained this already. I will I'll try to speed up the pace a little bit. Um, Mark explained this already. Um, um, how to build the, the RFQ ingress and the BigQuery exporter. So the next step in our diagram would be then the ISIN ingress so that we can enrich our RFQs with the metadata. Um, so this is of course not an HTTP streamlet. Uh, so we have to consume from an FTP here. Uh, so we cannot use the, the ACA server streamlet here, but we have to use um, uh, something else. So in this case, we again uh, rely on our, the ACA streamlet uh, component. Um, and in this case, again, there is no uh, inlets um, because we have to manually get data from outside the cluster, basically. There's no, no upstream streamlet. Um, but we do have a single outlet, um, namely the one that will export ISINs and make them available for, for the enricher, the next step in the, in the diagram. Um, so again, we have to implement the runnable graph here. Um, 
yeah, we, uh, I won't tire you with the other schema of the ISINs. Let's focus on, uh, on the interesting task and implement this runnable graph. And we're going to use a little help here um, of a, yeah, a very nice project called Alpaca, which is basically a collection of libraries um, uh, of reactive integration pipelines. It's built, of, in, it's built on top of Akka Streams, and it makes it therefore really easy to in integrate common APIs to an Akka Streams application, um, FTP being one of them. So this is something that uh, is very, comes in very handy for, uh, for this particular use case. So um, there is, we use here the Alpaca FTP connector, and it basically defines uh, a simple object to list files from an FTP or from a path on an FTP. Um, uh, which basically provides an Akka stream source, which we can use in our streamlet. Um, a second thing um, that uh, that comes in handy is a CSV parser that they also provide, and um, their API provides a flow, so we can use this uh, while processing like the CSV files. So the ISINs. Metadata uh, is available in CSV files on our FTP. So first we get the file from the FTP, and then we use the Alpaca CSV parser uh, to parse them and uh, map it to our, our model. Um, so how would that look like? Uh, let's use those libraries. Um, so um, first we need to frequently check, like with some interval. So we use a source tick. Uh, every 20 minutes, we want to check the FTP. Uh, we simply use the ls command, um, and then we asynchronously um, read the CSV files that come in at that point in time. Uh, we convert it to our ISIN model, and then we just um, pipe it to our sync uh, for the next uh, streamlet to pick up. Well, that's that's basically all. As you can see, just a few line of codes of code with the with the right libraries uh, in place. Uh, it doesn't have to be very difficult. Um, so then the next stream would be the enricher, where here for the first time we're going to combine uh, multiple streams. Um, and the enricher, um, um, in this case, we are not going to use the Akka uh, streamlet because uh, this involves stateful stream processing because we have two streams coming in. A uh, stream of ISINs and a stream of RFQs, and we need to join them on a certain key, the instrument ID. Um, but we have no control over when matching elements will be available, right? The the RFQs come in at a certain pace, and the ISINs come in every 20 minutes. But we don't know when we get the right metadata that belongs to an RFQ that we already processed. So we need to keep the state uh, until we match the RFQs with the ISINs. Um, and then we can aggregate them. So that's why we're going to why we're going to use the Flink streamlet because Flink already provides a nice uh, framework for stateful stream processing. So that's exactly what we need right now. So in this case, then we have two inlets: an ISIN inlet and an RFQ inlet, and we have a single outlet, the enriched RFQ, which is a very simple model of just combining the two. Basically, it's. Um, yeah, so uh, the logic, um, we don't need to implement a runnable graph um, because that's the Akka Streams API, but here we need to implement a Flink API. It looks a little different. Um, so it needs to do those four things, read the RFQ stream, key by instrument ID, read the ISIN stream, key by instrument ID, connect the two, apply the enrichment, which in this case is just a simple aggregation, and then we will write the result uh, to the outlet. I will fast forward to the to show you the code. Um, so yeah, the reads we can use the read stream operator key by instrument ID. Um, it's actually pretty self-documenting code, I, I, I have to say. Um, here maybe, we connect. Uh, maybe interesting to, to mention that this code is, is not related to Cloudflow. This is actual code that you would be writing in the Flink application yourself. So this is the Flink yes. uh, API that you're essentially using within uh, within Cloudflow. Yes. Yes, and it, it, indeed, that's the same for Akka Streams. If you're used to Akka Streams, it shouldn't uh, give you a lot of trouble to to write Akka Streamlets. And the same goes for for Flink, indeed. Um, and there are other runtimes as well, like Spark. Um, so if you're familiar with that, you can also use uh, use that. 
Um, so as you can see here, uh, we apply an enrichment function. So you, of course, you need to implement that as well. Um, it has a, uh, a little bit of a complicated signature. Um, there's actually two flat map met methods that you have to implement. Um, the first one uh, is called for each incoming RFQ, and the second one is called for each incoming ISIN. Uh, so yeah, you need to make sure that um, uh, when an RFQ comes in, you check in your, in your current state if you already have an ISIN uh, that matches this RFQ, you combine them, and uh, vice versa for when an ISIN comes in. Um, and yeah, after you've matched, you can actually forget about that uh, that state because then you already process that uh, uh, that match basically. So yeah, I'll, considering the time, I will just skip through these slides a little bit. Um, we can uh, yeah, we will publish the code uh, for this later. So let's focus on the on the the Firestore exporter part. That would be um, um, yeah. After that, we will have like a connected graph again, and we can deploy our application again. Um, so the implementation of that is not very interesting. It's very similar to what Mark showed you for the BigQuery exporter. Um, it's just using a different Google API. So from a cloud point of view, it's exactly the same. You get one inlet, and you get um, one outlet. So we have um, to connect those. We have to upgrade, update our blueprint. So um, we have the two ingresses, we have the enricher, and we have the two exporters, and we will set up the uh, connections accordingly. And the last component would then be the predictor. So where we actually process the raw RFQs and the price data and also store it, uh, uh, export it to, uh, to Firestore. Um, so again, here, we're going to use Flink. This, this is, again, uh, we can benefit from the windowing support that is built into, into Flink. Uh, this time, we have a single inlet, because we only get RFQs. Like Mark explained, to simplify, we already have the price data embedded in the, in the RFQs, so we only need one, uh, one inlet. Um, and a prediction comes out. So here we read the stream again, key by instrument ID, and we use a windowing function. Um, so we assign timestamps to each RFQ. And um, in this case, we assume all timestamps are ascending, so we can use a simple function, simple sliding window uh, window function here. Um, yeah, if, if the timestamps are not ascending, you might need something a little bit more complicated than this. But yeah, if you're familiar with Flink, um, you can figure that out. So here we create sliding windows based on event time. Uh, then again, you need an aggregator. So we have a prediction aggregator. And in the end, we write the stream uh, back to, uh, to our outlet. So um, just to summarize what we've seen. Um, so what, what did we do here? Um, we, uh, we assembled a streaming application of independent stream processing components and were able to pick the right tool for the job. For some streamers, we used Akka, um, and for some, we used Flink, uh, because there we needed stateful stream processing, and Flink was a better fit. And um, yeah, so we could easily apply those different runtimes without any, any problem. Cloudflow was taking, uh, was taking away the, the complexity for us. Um, Cloudflow provided the building blocks for the development, um, so the streamlets, and uh, it also helped with uh, with deploying and, and managing. So, um, uh, as Mark said, with a simple command, you can roll this out to Kubernetes. The streamlets will be uh, automatically deployed as, uh, as pods, and we didn't have to write a single line of uh, YAML like uh, uh, you used to need to do uh, when dealing with Kubernetes. And thanks to Kafka that's there under the hood, we don't have to fear data loss. So when, when it fails, we can retry. And when one of the streams fails, we can retry processing the stream and we, we are not losing any data. So, uh, so that's pretty cool. So before I want to show you the demo, um, I have one slide left. Um, 
with some hints for the future development of, uh, of Cloudflow. Um, so this is a little disclaimer. This is some information that was provided to us um, by some uh, maintainers of the Cloudflow project already a while ago when, uh, while we were doing this project. Um, so I think they already worked on enterprise readiness uh, uh, quite, quite a bit. So um, it's already in a, in a further state than when we started dealing with it. Um, they also told us they want they have plans to support different runtimes, like for instance Kafka streams. But was what was interesting, they also mentioned they are thinking of supporting Python, for instance. So that would be really nice. Then, as a data scientist, you can use your pandas and and all the tools that you're, that you're used to, and yeah, develop uh, and connect it to uh, to Scala streamlets, for instance. That would be uh, pretty uh, pretty amazing if they pull it off. Um, they also mentioned integration with cloud state, so to have like stateful serverless streamlets. I also uh, uh, read that Lightband is um, soon launching um, Akka serverless, so maybe that would also be an interesting candidate for integration. Uh, I'm not sure what the status on that is, but yeah, I think um, the tool has a lot of potential and um, yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to how this tool will, will uh, develop itself. And I think um, for uh, for enterprise readiness, I think that the, the major thing is that uh, Cloudflow in the beginning it was it, it was responsible for everything. So it would deploy its own Kubernetes cluster, its own Flink cluster, its own Spark cluster, depending on what kind of streamlets you use. Um, and obviously, within a lot of enterprises, you simply cannot just run your entire infrastructure yourself. So you would probably have to integrate with already set up uh, Kafka clusters or Flink cluster. Um, and that at that time was something that they didn't support uh, support yet. But we're, yeah. we're well aware of. Yeah. So um, I think we have a few minutes left. So for the demo, um, I already uh, prepared basically a deployment. Like um, uh, as Mark mentioned, with a simple command, there's a kubectl cube Cloudflow plugin, which allows you to um, deploy you, your application. Uh, can, you, can you enlarge it or full size it? So I'm uh, seeing your browser and a little, little terminal on top of it. Yeah. Let me try it. Is this better? Yeah. Yeah. The, okay. Uh... Yeah. So basically, there's a there's a command which lets you atomically deploy your application. Uh, Cloudflow yeah. generates a JSON yeah. file um, that contains all the information that kubectl needs to know to deploy your streamlets as uh, uh, as pods, basically. Um, so I already I already ran this command. Uh, I can show well, it running, in, running this in my browser. No one, so. no one happy right now. R running it no, would basically exactly mean it's build all the products, uh, <laughs> deploy uh, or, or upload Docker images. Um, it tends to take uh, take quite some time. Yes, exactly. Yes. So we, we already prepared that. We have a cluster running. And this is my playground. I have, yeah, you can see the Cloudflow operators being there. Uh, there's a Kafka operator, uh, Zookeeper, Flink. Um, and in the stock market app namespace, there are actually two of our uh, streamlets. So this is the this is the situation that, that Mark showed, where we just have the RFQ ingress and uh, the BigQuery exporter. Uh, so they are actually running in their own namespace. We set up a um, fake uh, FTP server, but we're not we're not using that now. Um, basically, those two streamlets are running. Um, the exporter is connected to a BigQuery instance. Um, actually, the, there's no data in it in it uh, right now, as you can see. So so maybe, maybe interesting. Maybe interesting to mention that um, Cloudflow will deploy your application in its own namespace. So again, this is an enterprise readiness part, which is difficult. Um, in an enterprise, you we might not have access to create your own namespaces in Kubernetes, uh, but this is something that Cloudflow at that time at least needed to have. Um, so when you would deploy a completely new Cloudflow application, it would just create its own new namespace. Yeah. Um, I see one question. So is Flink used as a library, or is the Flink cluster deployed to Kubernetes? It's actually deployed to Kubernetes. Yeah, you can see it here. That the Flink operator is present. So if you want yeah. to develop uh, Flink streamlets, you would have to uh, deploy this uh, Flink operator. Um, but yeah, on the Cloudflow documentation, this is all this is all mentioned. So Aka, yeah. the Akka streamlets, you don't need anything additional. But if you want to do Spark, if you want to do Flink, you need the the operators. Yeah, um, so that's a one-time one thing that you need to do to set up Cloudflow, and and yeah. then any streaming application that you build will be 
under the hood using that operator to spin up a new cluster um, if your stream processing uh, application uses uses a flink stream that basically yeah so what i want to show you now before time runs out um, i'm going to set up a port forwarding um, to uh, to our ingress basically so here you can see the streamlet name ingress um, if you zoom, zoom in a little bit maybe Mm. Okay. What is it? Command plus. Yeah. Command plus. Yes. I think. Yeah, much better. Yeah. I'll make it a uh, little. I have to switch tabs, so I'll also zoom in here. It's better, right? Yeah. So yeah, I've set up a port forwarding, and now I want to feed some some data in. Uh, some some RF, some fake RFQs um, into our cluster. So this is just going to hammer. And as you can see, Akka is responding with okay, it's been accepted. Of course, it doesn't know if it's really uh, if it's really uh, processed yet. We will figure that out. Um, So if I check my stock market namespace, I have my apps here. So I can actually, so in the ingress, there won't be a lot of interesting stuff to see because this is just um, the, uh, yeah, the Akka server basically posting and writing to our, our outlet. But uh, if everything goes well in our exporter, we should see some logs of data coming in. So here we can see actually the, the parsed records uh, coming in, converting to, uh, to BigQuery and then hopefully they will be written to uh, to our BigQuery um, by now. So here we can see some results with the timestamp. So yeah, this uh, this basically shows at least an end-to-end -end, uh, flow um, on on Kubernetes um, on a live cluster, um, and you can imagine how this uh, when deploying the full application will also uh, uh, yeah will also uh, uh, work yeah great thanks guys uh, it was an amazing talk uh, I must admit uh, quite technical but uh, quite uh, well explained with a nice uh, structure so I guess easy to follow uh, for all of us um, uh, there is still another question from uh, Kaiman, he's asking if uh, yeah, you're also using the Flink cluster to provide restart capabilities. Yeah, yeah. so um, Cloudflow, there's a lot of Cloudflow that we, we weren't able to cover yet, but there, there's, a, there's an open source version and there's an enterprise version, but what they always give you out of the box is Prometheus endpoints. So any stream that, that runs will have Prometheus endpoints. So to answer the second question already, yes, you can get those metrics out of the system, um, obviously, with Lightband, uh, the, the Enterprise Edition, they give you a graphical interface for Cloudflow, which not only allows you to easily uh, scale certain streamlets up or down, but it will also give you a lot of debugging and operational uh, support um, regarding your streaming applications, basically. Um, so you will be able to easily see the entire application laid out um, and with uh, also showing with which streamers, for example, are crashing or to get insights into specific metrics. Um, with regard to the restart capabilities for a Flink cluster, um, so yeah, Flink does have its own mechanism to restart failing jobs, and obviously that is still being used. Um, so um, I assume, but I'm not 100% sure, I assume that if Cloudflow deploys a Flink application, it's doing nothing more than using the Flink operator to run your application. So the code that you saw with the, stream, the Flink streamlet, it will compile that into an actual jar, an actual Flink application with Kafka integration and everything out of the box. Um, so it's not going to deploy something else. It's really going to deploy a Flink job like any other Flink job that you would manually run into that cluster. Um, so yeah, it will use those restart capabilities. Yes, I believe that's true. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Mark, for, the, for, for answering the question. I might I have, have a couple of questions uh, as well, if there are no more uh, questions from the, from the chat. Maybe we can have uh, five, uh, two, three minutes more. So my first question is that you guys started with this uh, cloud uh, flow during this project. Am I correct? 
decided to make it. So no, we we didn't actually use it for the the actual project. It was a, a product that we um, that we were both building for a longer time. Um, and at a specific point, um, Cloudflow uh, was released, and we thought, hey, this this is a, a really good um, use case to see if we can what, what boundaries are we going to hit because we were essentially running into all the problems they described. Uh, so it's yeah, more it apply, a, applying that product to see how much simpler it could be if we uh, if we had something like this. Yeah, it was really it was fun to see like um, how we how much time we spent in like configuring Kafka. Um, we had uh, both Akka, we had and uh, Flink, um, yeah. and it was uh, yeah really time consuming to uh, to maintain and uh, both code bases, uh, make sure the the connection worked. Um, the uh, yeah, the, the the mapping the data models in uh, the schemas were matching uh, in Kafka. So indeed, all the all the trouble that uh, that Cloudflow actually solved. Uh, yeah, we we went through <laughs> we went through uh, manually. Uh, ourselves yeah. manually, and uh, yeah, so okay. we we really thought this would be uh, would be a great use case, and uh, yeah. Indeed. So I mean, I, indeed, the last error prone because I saw you had quite minimal configuration in the end. Uh, yeah. Compared to what you were described in terms of uh, okay, if I have to write my deployments at YAML, do not talk all about the infrastructure as a code that you need to maintain for that. Yeah, uh, mm, yeah. There, there are yeah. so so many aspects. Of course, if you build a, a single service, I mean, it's indeed the, the maybe a Helm chart, it's a GitLab pipeline, it's um, it's a Kafka integration, it's a Prometheus endpoint, it's a server. I mean, there are so many health. There's health checking. There's so many concepts that you will need to do and. Uh, yeah, you it, it, in any microservice landscape, you tend to do that a million times. <laughs> yeah, no, amazing, amazing. Uh, second question uh, ahead. I noticed from your presentation that uh, it was quite. Uh, I mean, we are talking about a distributed application, but it was quite distributed agnostic. I mean, in the sense that apart for the Kafka keys that you needed to specify to be sure that the partition were matched between producer and consumer. I didn't see any of this kind of issue explicitly in your uh, in your presentation maybe of course you didn't went that uh, down in the details but it seems to me also quite a distributed agnostic in that sense yeah it's pretty cool that um, that basically as a developer you don't really notice that much that uh, indeed uh, those um, those streamlets are running into different jvms into different uh, different containers even um, so it's it is as if um, you are just uh, if it, if it's just libraries, right? That you're connecting uh, uh, while coding. I mean, you're using the same uh, same models. It's generated code, so you don't have to you don't have shared libraries or stuff like that uh, that you need to deal with. So indeed, it's uh, it's nice that you uh, made that remark because um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And also, you can see with the with the local sandbox, um, it's quite easy to to spin up. Uh, within within your SBT instance, so you don't need to go to Docker Compose or do anything yeah. manually. You should just Good. run from SBT. You spin up your complete uh, complete stack, and uh, yeah, so it's it's quite yeah. powerful. Yeah, wow. the the, the, bi the biggest boundary is the well the external uh, boundary of your system. So interacting with a, the, a fake HTTP server. Let's say that you want to run this locally. Well, we are obviously connecting to BigQuery, but yeah, you, you can't run that locally, so you might want to um, run it against a real BigQuery instance, which is different from production, or maybe you just want to have some local morph or whatever. I mean, those those type of boundaries you still need to cater for. Yes. Um, but anything in between, so any anything from streamlet to streamlet, that's that's all super simple with one command. Yeah. And I, you guys presented a case within Google Cloud, but I guess uh, Cloudflow is uh, a cloud provider agnostic yeah. as well. Yeah, so they provide installers for uh, I think AWS, Azure, and uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes, so Google Cloud, um, or for Kubernetes, I guess. Um, okay. But yeah, you. I mean, as long as you have Kubernetes running somewhere and you can, with the right version, to use operators, um, then you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. I guess uh, there are no more questions from the chat. Uh, you guys uh, did an amazing job. And uh, thank you. I guess it's time to say goodbye to our audience, and uh, we hope to see all of you again at the next uh, Scala Tech Meetup organized by ING. And have a good evening. Good evening. Thanks again, Thank you for having us. You too. Thank you for having us, indeed. Have a nice one. Bye. Bye. Bye.